Tomorrow we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate the central moment of Christian history. And we celebrate because Jesus, God in human form, died for each and every one of us. He was buried and raised on the third day as scripture teaches, and he appeared to many before ascending to heaven. He is risen. Easter is the fulfillment of God's plan to save humanity. We believe that there is a cosmic conflict happening of which our planet plays a part. As good and evil, God and the devil play out this drama on the stage that is our planet and our lives, Jesus' death and especially his resurrection mark the defeating blow. We serve a victorious God. Today we are going to explore the message of hope and joy in Christ's death and resurrection as portrayed in the epistle of Philippians. The word epistle just means letter. Much of the New Testament in the Bible is made up of letters or epistles. Two weeks ago, we started a sermon series called Dear Church, and we looked at the little letter of Philemon or Philemon or Philemon, however you want to pronounce it. We we did not come to a consensus on how that's supposed to be said. So today we look at Philippians. Why choose Philippians for Easter Sabbath? Why not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, the Gospels, with the accounts of the resurrection? It is a fitting letter to look at on this celebratory Sabbath because one of the main themes of Philippians centers on the transformative power of Jesus' sacrifice. It doesn't just tell us the story, it tells us why the story matters. Philippians, Philemon, Ephesians, and Colossians make up the prison epistles. They are written by the Apostle Paul while he is in prison for preaching the gospel, and Philippians is probably written around 59 to 62 AD. This letter is addressed from Paul and Timothy to the believers in Philippi. Philippi is a Roman colony located in Macedonia. Because it sits on a main road connecting East Greece and West Asia Minor, it is an important and wealthy location. The book of Acts tells a story when Paul and Silas visit this town of Philippi. They run afoul of local businessmen. They are beaten. They are thrown into prison, and God delivers them. Their first converts in the city include their jailer and Lydia, an affluent businesswoman. So we can make some assumptions. This letter is going to the church in Philippi, And we can assume that the group receiving the letter are wealthy people with strong connections to Rome who have supported Paul financially over the years. This is mentioned in Philippians chapter 4 as well as 2 Corinthians 11. You'll remember that Paul's letters, his epistles, follow a basic outline. Greeting, thanksgiving and prayer, the thing he's writing about, greeting and sign-off. As we look at Philippians, we see this pattern repeated. Greeting, thanksgiving, and prayer, the thing he's writing about, which is unity, Christ's example, and faithfulness. Greeting and sign-off, but there's a problem. What are those numbers over there? They only go up to 2 verse 30. There are four chapters in Philippians. Paul goes off the rails a little bit. So he signs off. He says, 
you know, peace be with you, I'm sending Timothy and Epiphrat, I can't pronounce his name, another guy with this letter. It's been, I hope to come to you soon, bye-bye. Oh, by the way, I'd like to tell you about rejoicing. And then he goes off into this whole two more chapters of another thing before he signs off once again. So some people think that this is two letters uh, that have been melded together. I think that it's one. I think he's just a pastor who got a little carried away. Half of the book is at first glance an ADD postscript, a Midwestern goodbye, a very interesting rabbit trail. You already said the thing, Paul. What are you doing? So today we're going to look at two passages in this book, one from each thing, okay? We're going to explore this hope and joy that this book talks about as it connects to Jesus, death, and resurrection. We're going to start in Philippians chapter two, and I'm hoping that you will join me on the even numbered verses, okay? So here we go, we're going to read Philippians chapter two, verses five through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This passage, Philippians 2 5 through 11 is sometimes called the Song of Christ. It describes the condescension, death, and glorification of Jesus. Now, those are big words condescension, death, glorification. So let's pause and define some terms together. When we hear condescension, or at least when I hear it, I don't think good things. I think. <clears throat> patronizing or talking down to, oh, they're, they're being condescending, right? That's not a positive thing. So that's not how it's being used here, okay? It is being used to mean humbling or lowering. It's not a, a way that we use it in the English language anymore very often. So here, what it means, the condescension of Jesus means Jesus, fully God, pre-existence from before time began, becomes a human. He lowers himself or condescends to our physical bodily form that is confined in one place and time. He condescends to our human language so that he can communicate God's character to us in a physical and verbal way that we can understand. Jesus condescends to humanity. The condescension of Christ is him becoming a human being. Paul describes this. He says... Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, he condescended, by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men of humanity. God in human form, God condescended, then submits himself to human death. 
Paul goes on, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Not just any death, not just natural death of old age. No, he humbles himself to the point of a painful, terrible death, the worst death that can be imagined at that time. By the end, that is not the end of the story though, right? Jesus condescends, he dies, and then he is glorified. Therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is obedient. He goes through with the divine plan at great cost to himself. The journey to the cross is an act of love. He displays amazing humility, a willingness to empty himself for the sake of others, to become something less than. And what follows is the exaltation, the glorification of victory, of love, of a job well done. That glorification follows Christ's death and resurrection. Philippians tells us this story clearly, not from our perspective like the Gospels, but from God the Father's perspective. Maybe my battery is dying in my clicker. There we go. It, Philippians, focuses on Christ's dual act of giving up his equality with God and serving God as an obedient human being. The Philippians song is unique in the New Testament because it explains Christ's death solely in terms of his relationship to the Father. The purpose is to uphold Christ's love and humility toward God as a model for our behavior towards our fellow believers. Christians give up claims of equality and serve one another in love and humility. I was listening to a podcast this week, and uh, as part of it, they were interviewing someone, and it was talking about how um, this individual had great respect for Christianity for the belief structure, but not so much for the people. Because sometimes church people are mean. And I was, I uh, then was on Facebook and I was scrolling and I came across a video of a waitress at an Italian restaurant and she told about a group of church people who came in, 25 of them wanted a table immediately with no reservation. Understandably, they had to wait and The leader of the group wasn't too happy with that. And this waitress is telling, you know, she said, I'm a Christian too, but man, I did not like these church folk. She tells about their terrible behavior as guests at this restaurant and that she, as their waitress, was trying to get them out of there as quick as possible. And I thought, that doesn't sound like giving up claims of equality and serving one another in love and humility. These few sentences in Philippians give us an arc of condescension, death, and glorification. They paint this beautiful picture of the plan of salvation from a different perspective than we often hear it from. Yes, Jesus died for us. Yes, God's love for humanity is important and impressive and meaningful. But the relationship between God and The Father and God the Son, Jesus, is big and beautiful and often overlooked. We are more worried about ourselves, aren't we? We are called to model their relationship, to lower ourselves, to elevate others, and to serve willingly, lovingly, and humbly, not to demand. Paul finishes this section of the epistle saying that he hopes to come soon. He's sending friends, and he writes, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And uh, that's where he goes off the rails, right? That was the perfect ending. 
You just had this big moment. And then his little ADD brain takes a left turn. Paul has almost landed the plane. And then he takes off again. He shares his biographical statistics. How he was a Jew among all Jews, how he did everything right, how he kept the law, and it wasn't enough. I think that Paul said to himself, let me just, let me just mention this little side note about rejoicing. And then it gets away from him. But just because it gets away from you doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit isn't working in that. So let's read what Paul has to say in his rabbit trail that we join him in. Once again, if you would join me in the even verses. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lies because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul has just said, I did it all right, and it meant nothing. Worldly achievement is inadequate. Knowing Jesus is what matters. There is surpassing value in intimacy with Jesus. What should we be doing? We should be pursuing a deeper relationship with the risen Savior. We serve a God who is not just a good teacher. Not just someone who gives us a moral compass or guiding narratives. Not just another path to the same thing. No, the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus, is not a religious leader who loved and died. He is God himself. He condescended. He became like us. He died and he rose again. We serve a living leader, glorified in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, waiting and ready to return to earth to bring his children into perfection and to reshape our world into a place without pain or death or sin. We are called by faith to participate in his resurrection, to experience the power of Christ's victory over sin and death. We do this in part in baptism. We are lowered into the water as Jesus was lowered into the tomb. We are raised out of the water into a life of faith. As Jesus publicly appeared after his resurrection, we publicly proclaim that we choose to live a life of faith. We participate in his resurrection when we mourn the death of loved ones. We remember that the disciples also mourned Jesus. We know what they did not. We know that the resurrection is coming. We live in that hope. Even in the midst of our own suffering and sorrow, we do not mourn as those without hope. We anticipate the glory to come. And we await Jesus' second coming when the dead will raise and we will be reunited with our loved ones. Paul says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness of God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings. Faith is something we believe. It is also something we do. 
Faith is an act. Faith is an act of giving up all grounds of boasting and confidence that lie outside of Christ. It intensely seeks a deeper engagement with Jesus. For Paul, the cross, a symbol of defeat and humiliation, means that God has rejected as worthless all the ways by which the world seeks salvation. Education, good upbringing, prestige, social advantages, and personal achievements, certainly these have much value in this world, but they are of no value when it comes to salvation. Faith in the crucified Savior means embracing God's method of salvation, the cross, at the expense of all others. Jesus is exclusive. Not that he chooses exclusively to only love certain ones of us. No, he is exclusive in that we choose him and no other way. When we choose Jesus, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Stick with me, and I'll have your back. Faith is an act. It is something we believe and we do. As Christians, we live the truth of Easter, the condescension, the death, the glorification of Jesus each day. Easter is not just a day. It is a way of living in the world, of doing our faith. The cross is a call to action. If we are living in the power of the cross, if we truly know that we are serving a risen, living Savior, then hard days become bearable. Jesus gives hope for tomorrow, belief that our actions today matter far less than the God who loves us. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus whispers to each of us. He says, you are are safe in me. You are secure in salvation's gift. You are loved completely. I want you. You are enough. You are, I am your purpose. You are mine. I encourage you in the coming weeks to seek deeper engagement with Jesus. With this Jesus who calls to us, who has condescended, crucified and been glorified. He is risen indeed. Bow your heads with me. Father, we commit ourselves to walk in the victory and joy of the resurrection. Lead us as we find ways to connect with you, Lord. Whether that is reading our Bibles or singing with radio stations, Let us see you all around us, and let our love for you grow and abound. Amen.